Good day everybody, once again we're back together and this time we are looking at the Gauteng June exam. I know uh, some of you recently wrote those exams so if you have not subscribed please just make sure you're part of the family. Right, let's quickly have a look at uh, what this question paper entails and by the way we've got our camp that's coming up uh, between the 1st and the 5th of June so if you are you want to improve your maths or science results uh, make sure that you join us for that all right so let's join in um so that we can see what this paper has all right so we start with the uh, multiple choice section right so they say two forces f1 and f2 are applied on a box lying on a frictionless surface right as shown below the magnitude of f1 is greater than the magnitude of f2 right so now they say the box will so note in this case it will definitely accelerate because there is a net force right so it will uh, accelerate in the direction of uh, the net force which would be to the direction of f1 uh, since we are told that f1 is greater than f2 so it will accelerate to the right so the correct answer there should be b right and they say to us we've got a five kilogram uh, iron shot put and a 10 kilogram aluminium uh, shot put with the same diameter uh, they fall free, uh, freely from the shelf that is 12 meters above right from the ground so they say ignore the effects of air friction Right, now they say when the shot puts are three meters above the ground. So note they come from the same height and they are going down and they are now three meters above the ground. They have the same. Okay, now I want you to note that as they go down, um, because they are free falling, their velocities should be the same. However, remember that momentum is a function of mass and velocity and note that their masses are not the same, right? And then secondly, acceleration. Definitely, they would be accelerating due to gravity. And so as a result, the acceleration is the same. And you'll note that both potential energy and kinetic energy are functions of mass. So there is no way that those would be the same as well. Right, and 1.3, they say two asteroids, S and T, having masses m and 2m respectively are on course for a collision right now they say if the magnitude uh, of the acceleration of uh, asteroid s is a so meaning if we look at f uh, asteroid a f is equals to m times a right so that would be the acceleration which is a right so they say then the magnitude of the acceleration of uh, asteroid t is now note uh, ladies and gents, that um, acceleration is inversely proportional to mass, meaning if we wanted to find uh, acceleration, their net forces are the same. Remember, they're equal and opposite, right? So as a result, they exert the same amount of force on each other. The only thing that's different is now the mass, right? So the mass uh, is 2m, so that means that it will be actually half the acceleration uh, that we had before right so note in this case it should be a half of a right the next question they say a sound source approaches a stationary observer at constant velocity very important which one of the following describes the observed wavelength and frequency now note they said approaches right so meaning that the sound source is moving towards the stationary observer, right? So we know in this case that the observed wavelength. So remember when I'm approaching, the wavelength should be shorter, right? It will be less than, um, or, or rather, the, yeah, the observed wavelength should be uh, shorter than the emitted, the wavelength of the source, right? Uh, so now let's see. They say the wavelength and frequency from the sound source as it approaches, right? So uh, firstly, observed wavelength is definitely less than, right? So that would be uh, less than 
but let's look at the observed frequency. So remember that frequency and wavelength are inverses of each other, right? So the observed frequency should be greater than. So let's look at that combination. So that's less than and greater than. That should definitely be D. Okay, right. Now let's go on to the next one. They say we've got two objects, M1 and M2, at a distance R apart, right? Um, experience gravita gravitational force F, right? So which means that if we were to express that, F is equals to G M1 M2 divided by R squared. Essentially, that's what they are telling us. They say the mass of M1 is now doubled and the distance is halved. So they want us to find out the gravitational force uh, between M1 and M2 is now. Now note, we started with force F, but now what will be the magnitude of our new force, right? If we now double the mass of M1, so it will be 2M1 times M2, and they say to us, to us we half the distance, right? So that means we've got a half of R, okay, squared. Now notice at the top we still have 2, so this will be 2G M1, M2. Remember that multiplication is commutative, so which means that we are essentially going to have the same, uh, we can rearrange them, so I only put the 2 this side, it doesn't change anything. Right now, I want to get rid of the one over four at the uh, denominator. So I'm going to multiply by the inverse, right? So four over one. So what I do at the bottom, I do at the top. That's four over one. Okay. So what do I eventually have? That's eight G M one M two over R squared. So which means the force is eight eight times what we had originally. So that would be eight F. Okay. So that's D. So the next question, they say an object is thrown vertically downwards towards the ground from the height h, right? With a velocity v, the object strikes the ground and bounces uh, upwards. It is caught when it reaches its maximum height above after the bounce, right? So, so firstly, we know that we are going to throw a, an object vertically downwards, right? Okay, so we know that the initial velocity cannot be zero, all right? Um, and then we know that the object will strike the ground and it will bounce upwards, right? Uh, in this case, they say which one of the following graphs of velocity versus time best represents the motion of the object? Now, first of all, ladies and gents, we know that our initial velocity cannot be zero, Okay, and so um, what happens? Our velocity starts uh, from a certain height and of course it's going to increase as we go down. Okay, and of course it changes direction when it gets to the ground and bounces uh, upwards. All right, now I want you guys to please note, if we took downwards as positive, right? So what's going to happen? It's going to start with a positive velocity and of course, it's going to increase, right, until we get to the ground, okay? And on the ground, what happens? It changes velocity, right? And now, look at that velocity. It becomes negative, and what begins to happen is that it decreases. So this looks like the correct graph, which is A, all right? Now, uh, if I look at B, uh, can you see those gradients are not the same? Remember that the gradient should be the same because it represents gravitational acceleration, right? So uh, for those two graphs, we should have the same uh, acceleration. Now, why can it not be C? Because C seems to suggest that our velocity was going up until the object stops and then it changes direction. So this would have been an object that goes up, stops at maximum height, and then comes back down, right? And then only uh, to change direction when it gets to the ground. And of course, it goes up until maximum height. And that's definitely not what we're given. 
Okay, the same thing is true with D. We start at a velocity and it goes up until maximum height. So that is why the only possible answer could be A. All right. So let's go to the next question. They say crate is pulled up a slope. Which of the following will do zero work on the object? Okay. So remember, in this case, we are pulling it up a slope. So there we go. Okay. Here's our object. We are pulling it up a slope. Okay. So which forces do zero work? It would be the normal force, right? Because it's at 90 degrees. But again, um, it would be the perpendicular component of gravity. So uh, those two forces would do absolutely zero work in that case. Um, so let's see. Uh, they said normal force, definitely uh, B. I would tend to agree with that. Okay. And uh, in this case, they didn't say the component of gravity, but they said gravitational force. And gravity does uh, a certain amount of work there. Okay. Because it has a parallel component as well. So uh, that would be B. Now they say to us, we've got three identical spheres, X, Y, and Z that are placed together in a triangular arrangement so that each sphere touches the, uh, touches the other. The three spheres are then moved back to their original positions. Right, now, please remember, once we cause spheres to touch, what we'll have or what we will do is that we now would cause charge to then flow, all right, uh, from the one to the other. Now, because they are identical spheres, the charge, uh, once you separate them, the charge on each one should be exactly the same. Right, so what we're going to do is take the charge on one, um, charge on two, charge on three, right, and we're going to divide by the number of charges that we have, right? So we've got negative five plus zero plus two, that would give me negative three, right? Okay, and so negative 3 divided by 3, that will give us negative 1 nanocoulombs, right? So that would be uh, the net charge on each of the sphere after they are separated. All right, now let's go to the next one. They say a positively charged object has, okay, so we know once an object is positively charged, it means that it has got a shortage of electrons, or we can say it's got uh, excess protons, positively charged particles, right? So uh, they say it has fewer electrons than neutrons, no. Uh, fewer protons, uh, no. Uh, fewer electrons than protons, that is absolutely uh, true, okay? Right, so there's a deficiency of electrons there okay and uh, finally 1.10 they say the minimum resistance that can be acquired from the connect uh, from the connection rather of two four ohm resistors is now remember if we place them in parallel ladies and gents that's when we can get the minimum resistance and of course if i've got four ohms and four ohms right it means that the um resistance uh, of the two resistors right will simply be two ohms now remember all we can do is r parallel that's uh, product divided by the sum so r1 times r2 divided by r1 plus r2 right so that would be uh, four times four rather uh, which is 16 divided by four plus four right that's product over the sum so that would definitely be 16 divided by 8, which would be 2 ohms. Okay, so just remember that whenever I've got resistors in parallel, right, um, and they are equal in uh, resistance, then the effective resistance in parallel will be half one of them. So that means that our minimum resistance there should be 2 ohms. All right. So, ladies and gents, that is how we come to the end of question one. Let's go on to the next one.